Hello, I'm Marion Manneker, and welcome to Art News Live. Today we're at Spring Studios with art advisor Kim Hairston and Koji Inoue, International Senior Director of Postwar and Contemporary Art at Hauser & Wirth. We're going to discuss Sotheby's live stream auction held on October 28th. The sale made $284 million and gave us a sense of the direction of the global art market. This conversation is part of our Art Market Monitor coverage of that market, and we're just going to jump right into the conversation now. It seemed like last night the biggest drama took place before the sale when the Baltimore Museum of Art decided to withdraw the, the two works that were in the sale and pause the private sale of a, a third large uh, Warhol. Um, I'm, I don't think we want to get into the whole deaccessioning uh, debate, but I did half wonder whether that wasn't a bit of a signal about market appetite, paused because of the um, uproar or, or caution about uh, uh, the sale. I was wondering if you guys could sort of uh, just comment briefly. Mm. Well, you know, all the eyes were on, on this sale last night because there had been so much discussion and so much with respect to the Baltimore brouhaha. Um, but it's interesting, I actually checked with a few of my sources, uh, ones I trust quite a bit, and they were really quite bullish on what was going to happen with the still. Apparently on both of those works, they had a lot of interest, which is really interesting. Uh, I feel that uh, probably the outcome was the best for Baltimore in the end, uh, not so for Sotheby's, but I think had those two works really uber performed, uh, we would be seeing a lot opening the floodgates of deaccession. So, in a way, I um, I think the outcome was the way it was supposed to be. But there apparently was interest in both of those works. The, you know, what's interesting about that is the other group that sort of lost were the potential buyers. Yeah. We know that there's a lot of demand out there. At the beginning of the pandemic, there's been this expression that many people were, you know, kind of rubbing their hands, hoping that things would come up on the market for various reasons. For a long time, they hadn't. You know, there was really, there was a dearth. No, and, and, and stills are rare. Uh, uh, Martins, usually large ones are, are rare. They have happened to be two or three that have been sold in the last uh, uh, few months. I mean, they're always very expensive, so that limits the number of people people who are, are, are there to buy, buy them. Uh, but, but Koji, do the buyers still have this feeling that they should be getting a deal? The top lot for last night's sale was $7 million uh, for a Calder. And you know, to not see those eight digit uh, numbers, uh, it's been a while. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that that's, you know, when the right material comes to market, the buyers are there. I do think you saw in the Impressionist and modern part of the sale much more um, compromising going on from the uh, consigners. There were clearly reserves had been lowered. Yes. <laughs> Things before. were eking by. Right. There, there, was, there, there was not a, a frenzy. I mean, a, a few specific lots uh, notwithstanding, there wasn't necessarily a, a frenzy. And part of that is I mean, we've had a very long run up in the art market. We haven't had a, a very significant pullback in prices. Maybe we have in volume over the last three or four, four years. It's still, when people want to sell, they, they expect to get good money. And uh, I think it feels like people are waiting it out or looking for the right opportunities. I found the Impressionist sale refreshingly sort of consistent and calming in a way. It just, uh, after what had happened in the post-war and contemporary sale, it just, there was a, a nice even drum hum, and I thought, this kind of harkens back to another time, but uh, at any rate, um, but there were some spectacular results as well. Well, Sotheby's rightly took a lot of pride in that they sold every lot, uh, you know, a so-called white glove sale, uh, in the impression of modern part. There were a few lots removed, though. <laughs> uh, you, you beat me to the point, which is a sign of just how good the auction houses have become at managing every aspect of the sale. That, that people would rather pull something than have it not uh, uh, sell, that they're in constant communication. There are very few flyers anymore, it, it feels like. There was also a flurry of um, 
third-party guarantees taken in both sides of the sa sale, you know, uh, in the run-up. And that's just increasing and increasing. You notice with every sale there are more and more, which is interesting. Everything has changed, but nothing has changed in the sense that, yes, like the way that we're interacting has changed, but the structure of the sales and the balance and, you know, the works that are there for certain areas, whether that's you know, pop art or abstract expressionist or contemporary or the modern period. So, you know, I found it interesting between the Impressionist Modern and Contemporary sale, we have a red hot market in the contemporary side that is cooling in certain components of it. And then you have a market that's been, you know, in kind of like a stagnation or a, a you know, kind of like a steady state or lowered expectations with estimates that were much more moderate for and precious and modern for five years, maybe longer. Now that's paying off in a sense that expectations are lowered and maybe the more the modern period is more exciting in the Impressionist and modern arena as opposed to the Impressionist. Let's say, I think that the Impressionist got it right, that sale was right. I found that they, they didn't really adjust and show the kind of flexibility I would expect for the uh, post-war and contemporary in the sense that um, they really overestimated the appetite for the, the Rothko, uh, which I liked and was in good condition, but that had been uh, for sale uh, in 2013. So I, you, you would have thought they would have had a better yeah. sense of that. I mean, that, that work overperformed. I think it was an estimate of uh, 15 in 2013, and it went for 27. And I just, I, I think that the, it was a little bit high too. Maybe would have started that a little lower. But um, interesting that there was a lack of flexibility. I think it's specific to each piece too. There's a bit of a, you know, I remember just how hard it is to get these sellers to consign these works and you know to agree to these estimates and that's why we see so many more guarantees now. This is what needs to be done in order to get them to answer your earlier question about, you know, yes, collectors are looking for a deal, so they're driving those estimates down as far as they can, but there are floors and you just have to be so much more precise, whether on the auction side or on the private selling side in terms of secondary consignments. So does, does the new format of these um, live stream sales with either a limited or no audience and the way things are presented on them sort of push us towards to even more managed sales? I mean, is that one of the reasons things are being withdrawn or is that just a separate issue? They were getting pretty managed well before COVID, I have to say. That's you why know, I say you felt that they really were changed, orchestrated. Right? They have been, they, they work really hard to put these sales together. They work really hard to manage the sales. They have always had these, you know, 90 something sell through rates and they're, they're able to maintain that. And that's because they know how to maneuver the sale uh, to, to create a success. There were even strange pockets of interest in a, in a market like Warhol, which has been a very hot market for 15 or 20 years and, and somewhat hit a, a, a wall, a plateau, whichever you want to call it, uh, three, four years ago. Uh, uh, and there hasn't been a lot of major Warhols uh, on the market. But curiously, there was a lot of bidding for two I wouldn't call them minor, but not necessarily Warhols anyone thinks of, the, the late one with the Lifesavers and the Albert Einstein Which was one. fun and poppy, I kind of, I kind of liked it. But, uh, uh, but the Einstein, I was a little bit surprised too, yeah. Baron, you bring up a really good point because, you know, on the private sales side, there were so many people talking in the market before about looking for the Jewish geniuses. And the auction houses clearly picked up on this too, and they sourced against that, knowing that there would be interest. And the Lifesavers, I'm not as sure, but there was definitely bidding from Asia, and I think just with the ad series and the brilliance of that, and you know, that late period, and how the prices are so much lower for that end of Warhol's market than the top end in the 60s paintings, uh, there is this kind of asymmetry where I think that collectors, while they can, you know, in Warhol, they believe in trust, and so they, they, they're excited at that kind of opportunity. Well, it just shows that people are actively, you know, not writing off the market, but looking for places within that mar market that you can find, uh, you know, something interesting where we had the um, endangered species a few years before that. Apropos the, the series, I was just thinking as I was reading the catalog essay, whether or not that series would be done in a, in a time like today. Just uh, food for thought, you know, with, with uh, cancel culture and 
everybody so incredibly hypersensitive about, uh, about these issues. Was there anything else that surprised you in the, these sales, either in things that um, did well or things that you, know, you thought there'd be more demand for? Sounds silly, it's not a surprise, but I was trying to figure out why uh, they had to reopen the bidding uh, for the uh, Lynette Boake, uh, Yeden Boake. Uh, and I think I heard a little uh, skip of a beat, a little arrhythmia. Uh, I, I don't know if either of you guys got that, where was there a skipped uh, lot? I actually tried to call Ali to ask him. And lot number three is the, the Lynette Yarden Boake, the striking portrait, the figure of eight, from a private French collection from 2015. Standing portrait here. And I could start the bidding here at $400,000. So 400,000, 450,000, 500,000 now, 500,000, 550,000. Yes, there it is, with you at $700,000. Thank you. Just to clarify the uh, confusion, it's with you, Nicholas, at $700,000, correct? 600, I was bidding 600. Georgia, do we have his bid at 700,000? At 700,000, still with Nicholas, it's $700,000. And I'm going to sell it now. It's Nicholas's bidder at 700,000. It's your bid in Hong Kong. Fair warning. And against you, Greg, last chance and selling. Nick, it's your bid for $700,000. Uh, a few minutes later, they announced that they were bringing the uh, lot back at the end of the uh, post-war contemporary part of the sale. And then they, they re-ran uh, um, the bidding with an entirely different outcome. Uh, and Chow uh, uh, took a while to make the opening bid and then sort of stood pat and let um, Gregoire Bileau's uh, client uh, buy it for $650,000. It looks like there was a skipped bid because if 650000 was the execute, which Gregoire had, and then the auctioneer had it, and then you know Nicholas's client is bidding 700. Is that the auctioneer's discretion after 200,000? They go in increments of 50, or usually go eight and then seven, right? Eight and then 700. So to take 680 is what he thought he was bidding, but then to be taking 700, that created, I believe, that confusion. Oh, so uh, explain for a second uh, what execute means. There, there was a third party guarantee on this uh, uh, work, which means that someone from uh, Sotheby's had to, in the room, make the irrevocable bid. You can either put the bid in the book or you can execute it in, in the room. And in this case, it looked like Gregoire had the bid you know, with him, or it was his client, or who knows. But essentially, he executed on 650,000. And then, yes, Ali, was, was he asking 680? Was he asking 700? There was this kind of moment of, of... His face didn't seem to betray anything. He was completely smooth. <laughs> he was smooth, for sure, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. It, it is, I, I mean, I mean look at, look, at the, look at the picture. He looks like a, um, I don't know, Bond figure or something. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he really very much has that look. <laughs> I mean, I doubt there's much of a lag, but there probably is more difficult to communicate with a screen that you're like canceling or taking a step back unless there's a specific, I don't know, baseball hand signal to like tell them to take that, take that last order back. I think in this format, if you hear that there's a bid at 650 and you know that it, if, it depends what other categories the collector is also bid in and they might be used to certain increments and the expectation that they were taking they're taking at 700 but who else is and he's trying to explain who else in the room is at 680 are there two people against me or is there one person against me and is the irrevocable bid being used to push me up higher or is it you know could i have jumped in first and gotten at that at that number right and that's why you know the auctioneer has to be very smooth in how they, you know, start the launch from wherever they start. I think it was probably around 450 or 500. Here we had just two bidders, uh, and maybe that's because of the um, uh, the irrevocable bid sort of said, "Hey, this is a good price. Uh, you know, uh, there's no good reason to to buy uh, spend more than than that uh, uh, for it." But it certainly was placed in the sale with the expectation to get of that generating. kind of momentum. I expected it to go much higher. I just also thought it was a really um, special work. So much of her work is on a dark background, 
with the figures emerging, but this was a light background and it was really beautiful. And although they didn't mention it in the catalog essay, I just couldn't help think of Cezanne. And uh, speaking of crossover collecting uh, in a way, which I'm seeing more of that and I'm hearing there's more of that. So I thought um, you know, her, the treatment of her face reminded me a little bit of um, some of the studies for, for the Demoiselle, you know, there was the uh, D'Avignon, there was the um, uh, Petite Danseuse, uh, 14 ans, you know, there, there's so many rich historical, I mean, that's what she does in her imaginary portraits, but I just thought this was a pretty, uh, pretty painting, and not only the imagery of the bather, uh, but the architecture and the palette was also quite Cezanne-esque, and I expected it to fly. I really did. So I was a little bit surprised. I mean, not that it, it did well, but a, in the context a, of today, I expected more from that I picture. I did too. It was a yeah. beautiful example. Beautiful, beautiful, light and just. Speaking of smoothness, I thought Ollie did a really good job with that snafu aside. Um, I thought he was sort of the uh, Kristen Welker of uh, auctioneers managing, uh, you know, some dis real disruptions in the, uh, in the course of the sale, especially with regard to the post-war and contemporary. I think he's always been an excellent. Yeah, he has. He has. But, but no, 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 he was delivered some no, blows no, 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 last no, no, no. night that I think I don't know if I <laughs> would be able to. No, no. He's, he's always been an excellent yeah, he's, he's But I agree amazing. with you that in this new format, yeah. he is really. He shines. He shines. Yeah. He's really smooth, and you know, even the how he manages the time between bids has. I mean, look. I'm not an auctioneer, so I shouldn't say it, but like, I feel like it, it, it's much more improved than what I remember from seeing in live auction. No, the pacing uh, is extraordinary, and, and considering that these sales require much more time, I, I, I don't know why it is, but I presume it's because looking through the screens, he's got to make sure that he sees where the bids are. He has to give people more time to be to, to, to signal and all. We had a, a, a little um, contretemps between him and one of the specialists who was sort of shouting, I've got a bid, and he was like, I heard you, can, you know, settle down back there. Or, uh, so it must be trying to do it in this format, people in three different locations, him in a, a location looking through video screens. Or the argument to that is without the audience distraction, you know, maybe it's a little easier. Do you want to look at the Wong for a second? And we move on to lot number two. We have the Matthew Wong, the, uh, the dialogue, a rich and evocative scene by the artist painted in 2018, property from a prominent European private collection. Some interest here, and I can start the bidding already at 120,000, 140,000, 160,000, 180,000 with Alex Branchik. 600,000 with Greg with Bio at 600,000. I heard it with you, Gregoire. 650,000 is Alex Branchik. And Alex Branchik bumming across the, uh, the Atlantic here at 650 now. 700,000 with Max Moore. Seven, it's 900, $1 million. Thank you very much indeed. And again, see there at $1 million. With Liz Sterling at $1 million. And that's the kind of bid we like at $1 million here. Thank you, Liz. It's your bid at $1 million. Absolutely clear, $1 million now. Looking for $1,100,000, what's next? $1 million. This is a new bidder at Sotheby's.com online, the future of bidding at $1,280,000. $1,300,000 now, it's against you online. At $1,300,000. Widley Sterling at $1,300,000 now. And are we gonna go on online? At one million three. Say one more, at one million three. At 1,300,000. Liz, it's still yours at 1,300,000. 1,320,000. Thank you, Sarah. 1,320,000. And she's back. 1,320,000. Sarah Pritchard's bidder there. There she is on the back row. 1,350,000. Thank you, Liz. It's three of the minutes still now. 1,350,000. It's currently with you, Liz. So 1,350,000. Give me 80 now. At one million three hundred fifty thousand dollars. One million three hundred sixty thousand. One million three hundred sixty thousand. Thank you, Sarah. At one million three sixty. And give me seventy. One million three hundred seventy. Fair warning to your bidder. Are you out? Thank you. And selling for one million three hundred seventy thousand dollars. Thank you, Liz. Something I didn't notice last night, Marion. Yeah. 
Liz Sterling's bracelet. I, funny, I was just going to say the same she, thing. That's why she, she won. <laughs> Liz Sterling like did very well, well in the dressing. Uh, 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 for some reason, you know, um, you don't notice them until you, you, you pay attention. But um, the, the, they've done a great job with putting the jewels on. Uh, I believe Brooke Lampley was wearing a, a necklace. I, I didn't Benjamin Dollar was wearing a, a, a Piaget. Uh, well, well, pa Patek, Patek, Patek Philippe. Philippe Patek Philippe, uh, exactly. They're selling the lifestyle. They're doing yes. a great job. Uh, this is a really fascinating lot. In yeah. fact, I'm glad you replayed it because now you start to see the dynamics of how well the sale was managed in terms of which pictures are put into which sale. Now, you'll have to fact check this, but like with the Shangri-La, the other painting that was sold in Asia, right? The, the one from earlier in the mo month. Earlier in the month. So, so just to back up, so to set up what you're, you're, you want to discuss, because I think it's very uh, interesting. You know, Matthew Wong, first of all, it's a beautiful painting and, and, and uh, in some ways quite striking among even the works we've seen in the last few um, uh, months, but there has been a, a kind of spike up in his market and then a, a, a coming down a fair bit. And then all of a sudden earlier this month, Christie sold one for $4.4 million and it, it seemed to give everything a jolt again. And it, it, this is not at that level, uh, but it's above where some of the works were selling. They were selling, I think, in the high six figures, you know, five, six hundred thousand dollars. Um, and so it, it is, you know, uh, uh, I guess the real question uh, for you, is, is that a direct response to uh, that sale? Is it just the right picture coming along at the right time? I think they picked the right picture for the right sale. Again, you know, like Liz Sterling, historically is an American painting specialist, who's also a great impression specialist and now a contemporary fine arts specialist. You know, her client base is still, and she has great clients, and they're still going to be very American-based. And Sara, too, who she was bidding against as the underbidder, uh, has great American clients. Uh, and here, you, know, you can't, I mean, maybe it's a projection, but I see Milton Avery. You know, I see a way of contemporizing a classic American collection with something that energizes the rest. So these are real collectors that they're bidding for. For an American artist too, I mean that's the imp the important part of this is like he's it's he's a tragic figure and that's w why there's so much de demand right right now um, well, because he committed suicide la last year. But m more importantly, there just seems to be a lot of different markets claiming them as his own, uh, as their own. Sorry, it's a perfect storm. In a yes, sense. if you'll indulge me, I wouldn't mind looking at the um, the Giacometti. Sale now. There were there were three Giacometti's on o o offer. Only one ended up getting sold. One had an enormous price tag uh, on it, which is one reason it was being sold pri privately. And we presume they announced at the beginning of the sale that they had sold it. So we we should take them at their word. They got their ninety million dollars or, or more for for that. And then we had a a second work that was sold privately before the sale which we can discuss after we watch this, you know, sort of what that means. But it was in then interesting to see this happen with the uh, remaining work. And lot number 111 has been withdrawn. So next, ladies and gentlemen, we have the prime example of Alberto Giacometti's towering female sculptures, the Femme Leone from 1947, named after the wonderful Villa Leone, of course, the Peggy Guggenheim Villa in Venice, the purchaser of the first of this cast, uh, from 1947, cast later, of course, this is one of the first tall static female sculptures that came to symbolize Giacometti's work for the remainder of his life. This wonderful, wonderful work, the third of the Giacometti's we've been offering this week, the only one now available for public auction. And I want to start the bidding here at $18 million, 18 million, 18 million, 500,000, 19 million now, 19 million, 19 million, 500,000 now, 19,5, at 19 million, 500,000 dollars. In a new place in Asia. At 20 million seven hundred thousand, it's with Yuki. 20 million eight hundred thousand. Thank you. I'll take you at 20 million eight hundred thousand. It's back with Brooke again at 20 million eight hundred thousand. Against you, Nicholas. 20 million nine hundred thousand. It's with Yuki again at 20 million nine hundred thousand. At 21 million dollars. How did you give me 22? At 21 three. 21 four. At 21 million four hundred thousand. Yuki, say one more. At 21 million 400,000. 21 million 500,000. 2 million 100,000. Still with Yuki here on this side of the globe. It's in Hong Kong at 22 million one. And Brooke, needing two from you, please. 
at $22 million, $100,000. Are you out? Fair warning now, at $22 million, $100,000. Still with Yuki, and I'm going to sell it this time. Last chance. At $22 million, $100,000. Fair warning now. Hammer's coming up, very last time. This masterpiece. Say one more, Brooke. 22 million 200,000. Thank you. At 22 million 200,000. 22 million 300,000. It's back with Yuki again in Hong Kong this time at 22 million 300,000. 22 million 500,000. Thank you. Much better. Can we try seven? 22 million 600,000. Brooke, what about giving me eight again this time? At 22 million 600,000. Here on this side, it's in Hong Kong, it's still with Yuki at 22 million six. Love to get to eight with you. At 22 million 600,000 dollars. There it is, it's with Yuki in Hong Kong. It's on the Asia desk this time, on this side of the screens, at 22 six. 22.6. There it is, at $22,600,000. Fair warning now. At $22,600,000. Hey, Brooke, what are we doing? At $22,600,000. No, there it is, at $22,600,000. Yuki, it's yours and selling. The family only, here it goes at $22,600,000. It's yours. <laughs> it seems so much longer the second time around. Yeah. Are, oh, so have have you slowed this down for the benefit of our, our discussion here today? Fast, like, uh, <laughs> like, yeah. well, what's so interesting is one, that, that they had real bidders in all three locations. It came down to Hong Kong versus uh, uh, New York. And, uh, you know, there were, it seemed like two bidders in Hong, Hong Kong, which is even more uh, interesting to all this. I think this new format is just wonderful because it gives us some sort of psychological insight into what the bidders are expressing. We get it um, you know, reflected on the faces of the specialist who's clearly either engaged in a tense conversation, a lighthearted one, an eager one. I mean, uh, uh, Barker is using that, that wonderful phrase, just one more. Uh, to try and coax another bit out of them, but there's there's a lot of work going on on the, uh, uh, those phones. Uh, w what do you think happened towards the end there? It was slowing down, we got to narrower bids, and then it kind of accelerated uh, past 22 million. And just when you thought Brooke was out, she comes back in, uh, which is always fun, because you wonder what that discussion is. <laughs> like, no, I'm not going any higher. Oh, I, I need it. I love this lot, because mm -hmm. this is a real throwback to like, you know, the art market of the early 90s, where you have like Japan and America, you know, and bidding it out. And I mean, I don't know if Yuki is on with necessarily a Japanese client, but we have seen the Japanese come back into the market in a big way, uh, the last being that Richter uh, with the Polo Art Museum. And here, uh, it's it's you know, absolutely their taste, and so, and then you know on the other side you have you have Brooke who has all the clients up and down Park Avenue, uh, and this object was in, in in the neighborhood. So it's it's just nice to be able to see that sort of dynamic again. Um, but Liter I will say, literally in the neighborhood, I was going to say, because that, that lived on 63rd between yeah, Park and yeah, Madison, right, Drew, and right. along with the other two right. Giacometti's. We're not mentioning the name. I'm not sure why. Yeah. But, oh, that, 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 uh, that's, no, we can, we can mention that. Mention that. The I mean, name. It's well reported, it, I guess, that, more that, than anything. That, that, that Ronald Perlman is selling the large one. And, and, and Brooke has clients who would be logical bidders for the $90 million grand femme. Uh, which w actually makes it more interesting that she's in the bidding for, the, for this one. one. And, and I guess that's part of the, you know, it's rare that we get three very similar works mm -hmm. for sale at the same time. And that's usually to one work's detriment. And in this case, it doesn't seem to have happened. We don't know what happened to the th third one, but I presume if they uh, uh, took a private uh, offer, that's usually a good sign that it was a good offer. offer. Yes, or well, yeah. Perlman was being, in the, in the, the 
the powers that be, let's say, were incredibly, incredibly uh, um, strict in terms of what was being accepted. And uh, uh, they really held the line, as far as I know, on a number of, uh, of the pictures, especially and, and sculptures, the most desirable. They were, they were not moving much. So it, you, can, you can pretty much know that it was good offer. It brings up another topic that maybe we can discuss about the groupings, right? If you have three Giacometti's, you have two Basquiat's, and you have three cars, you know, which is better to sell in groups, which ones to sell separately, and this is really debated for, I'm sure, uh, a long time in terms of what is the best uh, uh, methodology. But it's very tough because there's financial factors, there's artistic factors. Like remember when, we, when the Bacon triptych was sold, they were actually broken up and they were brought back together over time. And in the case of the Basquiat's, you know, they were heavily exhibited by Akira Ikeda and, you know, had a long international life and then went to Navarra, but they were from separate places and he brought them back together. Artistically, do they belong together, uh, historically, but then Financially, yes, they did the right thing. One sold for a million dollars more, and the led with the one with the crown, the more the iconography, and you know, commercially lifted the other one, and it's easier to swallow a bite that's at five million dollar chunks than ten to fifteen million dollars in one lot. So, you know, it gives more accessibility to more collectors, right? And if you really want both, you just keep bidding and you try and put both and keep both of them together. But that's not what happened. That's that, that was not what happened. Right? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. But so the crown was the, was the, it's the million dollar crown, it was yeah. the difference in pr For price sure. came down to having For the, sure. the yeah. I mean, like we, we were, we were watching with, our, with my, you know, all on a phone and Zoom going, the crown's gonna, you know, gonna get it. But um, uh, yeah, that was, that was interesting to know that story. But it's interesting that it, both uh, Navarro, which was a very interesting person and mentioning Akira Ikeda, I was just trying to describe, I, was, I described him as the Leo Castelli of Tokyo. Right. But, oh, that's but such like a great, yeah, that's such a great way to describe him. He's such a lovely him. man. I, I actually had a question if you guys thought that um, uh, the uh, Asian market was as involved in contemporary. I felt that there was a little bit softer there. They, they were, they kicked in for more for impressionist and modern. Did you guys notice that or was that, did I just make that up? There were a few lots, but I felt that there was quieter uh, in the beginning of the sale and the post-war contemporary sale, but um, that might just be an impression. Really interesting thing you pick, on, pick up on, Kim, because my experience in dealing with in Japan has been that there are two art histories. You know, mm -hmm. in the art history books, it ends at like Kaibat. Right, Like yeah, there exactly. is no, they don't even, like Warhol, <laughs> like all these, the kooning is not taught. And yet right. now you have a next generation, whether it's the Bridgestone Museum or younger collectors who are you know, rediscovering Warhol and Basquiat and, and then going really contemporary with you know, Matthew Wong or whoever it may be. But there is a definite split mm -hmm. in, that, in, the, in the taste. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's still the third largest GDP in the world right. and a history of you know, very um, aesthetic and you know, tasteful collecting. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, there is that generation which is kind of stepping back into impressionist and m maybe more so the modern uh, mm -hmm. period, but they are bolstering their impressionist collections, right? And bringing them more into the contemporary, because let's not forget, like, Giacometti is also a 60s artist. Right. So, mm -hmm. yes, that's, that's a really interesting point. As the, and I can only really speak to Japan in that aspect, but, you know, Broadly, I was there about it. China, Hong Kong, so many different political right. dynamics and financial, and I mean, it's just. Uh... This didn't have the feeling of a sale with a lot of work that we understand to be in high demand in, in Asia right now, but that shifts so much and we're never quite uh, aware. It was interesting that Patty Wong wasn't um, uh, anywhere to be seen. Uh, in all of this, and she's you know one of their sort of powerhouse uh, 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 people with uh, some of the biggest clients in uh, uh, China. So whether that's just because this didn't have uh, enough work that they were interested in, in it, uh, I, I don't really know. It didn't feel like you were hearing that much. It, it, from the lots we've been looking at, there's been a, a lot of uh, Hong Kong bidding, but I didn't feel like for the rest of the sale uh, uh, there was. Uh, and and it, I suppose, you know, we, we still have another um, round of sales to go uh, this year, you know, sometime in December. <laughs>
<laughs> and it does, it feels like we're on a precipice too because each one, you know, there was all this demand, but the sales are both doing well, but also seem to lack a certain energy. They, and whether that's just the prices are high and it's hard to get excited about it, or there's something else going on, you do kind of wonder, will the next sale be the one where it starts to cool off, uh, or that they'll have trouble getting enough work? Cooling, a lot of cooling last night. You know, you can, you can spin it any way you want, but there was cooling. It was admirably dealt with <laughs> and looked better in the end. I mean, but there was, you know, legitimately a lot of bullets dodged uh, last night. Uh, so uh, it kind of speaks also to the depth as well as the breadth of the market now. Like, you know, if, before I was making comments about kind of going back to Japan in the 90s. Well, you think about that time, it was really just Japan, America, and Europe. And it was like a three-legged stool. And Europe was not even... Really. Not, they not were enough, active yeah. sellers yes, more, exactly. than, more than the buyers really at the time. It was really New York and Japan. And once Japan, once that leg fell out, the stool fell over for about a year or two years, mm -hmm. right? Now you have this table that has like 10 legs. You know, for a while you had like the Russians in and then they kind of pulled back. The, the Gulf some states. Of them are there. The, the Gulf, Gulf states, states were there, Chinese were there. Yeah. You know, and so you have this table and you can knock out a few of the legs and it doesn't necessarily need to be geographic. It can be like masterpiece buyers or trophy buyers in some capacity or it can be uh, you know, people who are interested specifically in the kind of you know, when two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar lot estimated lots come up, it's much more accessible and you know, it's really just about getting access to those works that weren't available to them in the primary market. Uh, there are different motivations and factors that come into the, the, the reasons for bidding in, in auction. And so even though maybe, maybe, you know, we've taken, maybe even from the auction house perspective as well as from the collector's perspective, taken a step back from let's stop selling $100 million objects for, for a few seasons and see what happens in the, in the universe, right? If that leg is missing, you still have these sales that have 90% sold and, you know, or white glove for that matter, which you didn't even see in the, in the high of the market, right? Yeah. But that's no, no, and I don't think anyone saw that coming last night right. during the sale. They announced <laughs> no. it at the end. Oh white yeah, it's like, oh yeah, that is a white glove. It's like right. I never had a white wow. glove. <laughs> Man, I'm kind of jealous. <laughs> so, you want to so, go back to the auction house? Right? <laughs> so we, we've set, set a lot of reference prices in these, you know, uh, sales. But it does feel like a lot of the market is moving private, just because people know what a price is and they get some of the confirmations for for certain things uh, here and there. It, it, I suppose, sort of as the last thing to, to discuss, how, how does this affect the conversations you have with uh, clients? You know, either the, the incoming ones that they saw something last night and you get a phone call about, about either I paid too much for or, or we, you know, I, I want one of the, those or the, the other so side of it of your sort of think, thinking, uh, this tells me something I can go to my clients uh, with. I'm telling my clients it's now time to buy Judd. <laughs> I, thought, I thought Judd was soft. Um, I thought it, one thing I, I have to think was quite interesting is that uh, although, again, I'm told that um, Clifford still, you know, is going to go through the roof, but um, abstract expressionism, the, pow the powerhouses, I thought the um, also Perlman's uh, Franz Klein was a bargain. That was a really good picture in great condition. And uh, didn't, you know, sell that well. And, and David Smith's been kind of soft for a while, but like the the titans of uh, abstract expressionism were a little bit soft. So I I think that is interesting. And of course, again, the Rothko. Um, whereas the women, the Ninth Street women, two of them, um, did really well. Carousel, I like the picture. It was no Royal Fireworks. Royal Fireworks lifted that boat big time. Um, and it's really interesting because you know there was a time where you know you could only buy a Frankenthaler from the 50s and I've been loving her forever and buying her forever when she was so unfashionable it's not even funny I have to say Frankenthaler <laughs> and then, you know there were there was none for so many years that sold above the $800,000 mark for years even though they're in all the major museum collections all over the world at any rate and that changed with at Sotheby's Saturn revisited but um, uh, to see that painting last night, and, and it, well, actually, even Royal Fireworks, I you know, was just astonished because you didn't touch late 70s uh, Frankenthaler. So 
you know, if a great 50s two picture came up of Circa Mountains and Sea, what, what is that going to bring? So that's interesting. So that's just such a big reversal. And uh, I'd say the same thing with Krasner. That was a smallish Krasner, and those are not as uh, coveted, those uh, 63 pictures. I love them. I don't know if you guys saw the Barbican exhibition, uh, but there was a room full of those little jewel paintings, and they're, they harken back to her little image paintings, um, but they don't have that same sort of bravado uh, rhythm uh, that people love. But I tell you, um, I, you know, even four for that picture was a, was a good picture, a good price. And uh, I just thought, you know, in a, in a weird reversal, uh, the women kind of, kind of outperformed the, the, the men, the abstract expressionist women, or Ninth Street women. No, no, there's certainly more heat on, on right. uh, women from that period, uh, and if you're going to buy that kind of abstract work. Uh, I, the interesting thing to me about the Krasner was that um, it, it uh, foreshadows uh, Simone Huntai's mm -hmm. uh, kind of work, mm -hmm. but it wasn't, didn't look obviously like a Krasner. Right, right. I, 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 you would know it was, <laughs> but I don't think I placed the sister sister painting. <laughs> right. in but I don't, I don't think I don't <laughs> think the the you know the run of the mill uh, even museum goer or art lover mm -hmm. would would see that across the room and say wow that's a Krasner yeah. which just makes it an aficionado's uh, picture and that there's demand for that, that too. You know those crazy arabesques, but yeah, but um, they do connect to an earlier an earlier side of Krasner, which I think is also pretty phenomenal. I thought it was interesting to also point out who sold that painting, which was Sara Pritchard's buyer. And you know, Sara is, uh, is an avid lover of Krasner, and it goes to show, it kind of gives them a moment to flex and to like sell the artists that they really believe in and to give uh, expertise and knowledge to uh, whether that collector already was an existing Krasner collector or was looking to fit that piece in, I don't know. but. It was interesting to see that, yeah, for for a piece that may not seem as you know as um, as a, as a, the crown, right? <laughs> the signs and the signifiers of, of um, you know what people are traditionally looking for, and these auctions they kind of have that ability to raise that floor, if you will, and. You know, the 70s Frankenthaler does that very much in the same way that, say, late Picasso used to be unsaleable. They were like, you know, a million or less. Yep. And now they're 10 million 18. at least. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and for, for an eclipsing, uh, let's say, you know, classical for Picasso for a while, which I always thought was like, oh, you could have a 1920s, you know, incredible painting of a mother and child. It might not be the sexiest imagery for some, but um, like, you know, it's still really art historical. Right. It's really important. It is. And it it, is. I think to some extent that's happening a little bit with Dubuffet, where you, you're making those connections to Basquiat and graffiti and that kind of thing too. So we'll see. But, but though the, the deaccession Dubuffets did fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. they're Brooklyn good. did fantastic. Yeah. They're, they're, but they didn't they didn't take off. Now, the, 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 the Dubuffet market is a broad, very right. mature one. Not a Paris circus. <laughs> yes. <laughs> not, not a really in demand kind, 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 kind of thing. But it's still very much, you know, uh, uh, truly the definition of a blue chip work, you know, owned by a major museum mm -hmm. of a major 20th century uh, uh, artist who's got a lot of work and a broad so uh, influential. base of collectors. I can't thank you enough for uh, coming and doing this on such an awful day. It's, uh, <laughs> it's brightened up my day, I can say, at least. Mine too. And, uh, <laughs> and I, uh, I hope we do it again soon. I would so. love that. Thanks for having us.